Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Today, John and I have a very special guest. We do. Our favorite author, J.A. Jantz. Mm -hmm. And Art, you, you're among, as I am, among the people who are reading all of her books. Am right. I correct? I I've, I've got about, I think I'm on my 21st to 22nd uh, and a book of poetry. She's amazing. And yep. she has she has like four of a regular thrill of mysteries. She's got like four separate things from uh, uh, J.P. Beaumont, who we're going to talk about today. Yep. And uh, Allie Reynolds. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Joanna four. Brady, Allie Reynolds, the, the Walker family right. uh, mysteries. Mm hmm. Um, yeah, she's she's very prolific. How many right. now? You count it up. How many books has she written all together? She's actually written seventy books. Wow! Of, of which several of them are shared between two characters. So she's yes. written seventy she'll books. Have, she'll have Beaumont work with Joanna Brady to solve right. a mystery. Yeah, yeah, those are great books. Yeah. Um, so now, of course, we're going to talk to her today about her latest book which is called Nothing to Lose. It's a J.P. Beaumont uh, mystery. Um, and it's her 25th her twenty fifth book of the Beaumont series. That's like and the silver anniversary, isn't it? If it's 25, so it is, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, but the, the thing about Beaumont, of course, all her characters are different. Um, Joanna Brady comes from the Southwest. She's a sheriff in the Southwest, I mm -hmm. think, Arizona. Is that right? Yeah, and Allie Reynolds is a former newswoman right. who's a detective who was from originally from from Sedona or someplace. Went to California as a newswoman and then I came see. back. Yeah, she does great characters, and of course Beaumont is at now at this stage of book twenty five. He's a retired detective from Seattle, uh, living in even further north in the state of Washington in Bellingham, mm -hmm. Washington. And he's kind of coming out of retirement in this book. So anyway, let's talk to J.A. Jantz, our favorite author, about when we talk to her, we talk about everything. We talk about writing. We talk about her life, fascinating life. Mm -hmm. And we talk about her novels. So let's talk to J.A. Jantz. Bring J.A. on from the green room, from uh, Waiting in the Wings. Hi, J.A. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, I'm I'm waiting in the technological wings. Yeah, <laughs> where where life does not go smoothly as we uh, as we go. But before we go on, we were trying to get this to work, and it was giving all of us all kinds of problems. Yes, and I've been having technology issues the past two weeks. I um, we watched a TV program last week where. A guy was misidentified and ended up being shot by the cops due to being mislabeled on in an by an algorithm, and that really interested me because for the past several months I've been getting Facebook notifications for Joanna. Well, I'm not Joanna. I know that my character Joanna is fictional. So I felt no obligation to reply. And then last week, when I tried to reply to a comment on my blog on Facebook, it turned out Joanna, as my, an my answer was from Joanna. And I said, wait a minute, I'm not Joanna. I, I know nothing about Nellie's Taqueria somewhere in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> And then finally, finally, this week, it, it, and, and then things were coming to the Joannas. Now there are two of us. And finally this week, I had a, something from Facebook showed up and it said I could log, log out. So maybe I fixed my Joanna problem with ah. Facebook. But then I had another problem with my, my step counting pedometer on my phone and my watch. They just went completely haywire. I couldn't get the numbers to add up. Some numbers would go in from the watch and into the phone and others would not. The, it was just 
really weird. I, and I know enough, turn off the device, start over. Yep. So yep. I did that to the phone, I did that to the watch, nothing helped. And then night before last, I looked at my, at my watch and it said I had zero steps. And I knew damn good and well that I had 11,000 steps. So I was sitting there staring at it and then I noticed the settings. It was on wheelchair. <laughs> So I fixed that. And then I noticed it had me as an eight foot, one inch tall male. So In a wheelchair. In a wheelchair. <laughs> with no steps. <laughs> are you are you giving us the plot of a new soon future novel by J. A. Jance? I I believe that that will be the topic of this week's blog because it's just Considering what happened to us getting signed on today, it's too funny. But uh, yeah. yeah, well, but now, I gotta tell you, it, it, technology is a bugger. That's that's all I can say. Art but, is the one who deals with it uh, between the two of us. But um, all I can do is shake my head and say, "Okay, Art, what do you need?" You know. But okay, uh, Jay, so are now, you now? I'll try to get back on topic. I'm sorry. Oh, okay, <laughs> don't worry about it. It's a are mystery, you, and you're a mystery writer. In, uh, in J.A., the, are you often confused with your characters? Because you've got, what, three or four main... No, I, this is the first time I have gotten the hmm. wires truly crossed between a character and me. And it, I, every time I would get one of those notifications from, say, Facebook, I would say, what are you guys thinking? And I knew there was no point in trying to write them a letter and saying, hey, you guys, you have me wrong. And so I just thought, well, I'll just toss these notifications, which I have been doing with astonishing regularity. Yeah. But it seems to be fixed now. I have no Joanna messages today. So yes. that's and, it. and the the technology, the world of technology, the th the anonymous algorithm will yes. never call you back and say, Oh, I'm sorry. We just made a mistake. Our, we fixed our it. mistake. No, they're not yeah. ever going to do that. That'll ever. never happen. That'll never happen. Which is why I think I like novels because we don't have to deal with the technology. I'm not a Kindle reader, for instance. You know, I like the book. I like that. Speaking about pages. books. Speaking about yeah. books. Okay, there is a really amazing new book coming out, written by J. A. <laughs> Jance, and I just loved it. Thank you for sending us advanced copies. It was just a wonderful, wonderful J. P. Beaumont uh, uh, thriller. Well, thank you. I Nothing to Lose will be published on February 22nd right. of this year. So it's a 2-22-22 pub date. And the thing that it was 40 years ago in the summer of 1982 when I started writing the first Beaumont book. And so really? it's really wow. those this this year and this book marks it's the 25th Beaumont book but it's actually 40 years of us together as author and character oh, wow. and I, I think that's pretty remarkable but the truth of the matter is I still really like the guy and <laughs> and within within a matter of a page or two when I'm writing a Beaumont book all of a sudden I'll be inside his first person, sort of curmudgeonly older guy perspective with his little humorous asides. And I just feel totally at ease with him. That's um, interesting. When, when I wrote the first Beaumont book, I thought I was writing a standalone book and I was astonished when my editor bought it as the big as the first book in a series. I I didn't have a clue that I'd be writing a series and much less twenty-five whole books about that same character. But but here we are. And <sighs> since I was on this show, I know that I have brought a guy who is
has always been a committed nonfiction reader into the world of fiction. I, we, yes. Yes. We sort of had to drag him into this world kicking and screaming. You did. You did. That's right. art. Right. And I well, raise your hand. Yeah. And not only that, but I am into, I am now reading my 20th uh, J.A. Jantz book. This is since August. Yes. Well, you, you are, people have told me for years that reading my books is like eating Fritos because you can't read just one and it seems to be working right. for. <laughs> but the thing about, about my mysteries, they're fiction, but there's a whole lot of real life. Yes. Buried in the back of my books. Now, yes. J.P. Beaumont starts this book off with a very serious plumbing problem in his home. <laughs> and you may think I just made this serious prom plumbing problem up, but trust me, I did not because I personally, on Christmas Eve, many years ago, made the serious error of trying to fr flush <sighs> say it go ahead say it a number two <laughs> a frozen number two from an irish wolfhound down our indoor plumbing and so when you find Bo <laughs> dealing with this yeah i my readers will probably be saying oh, that would never <laughs> happen well excuse me <laughs> it did and it does <laughs> a number of years ago uh, i wrote i wrote a book called payment in kind and it started with a serious snowstorm right after christmas with the schools closed and kids snowboarding down or sli sledding down Queen Anne Hill in uh, Seattle. Well, this year we had a very similar snowstorm, only there was this polar vortex from the north and warm air from the south. And we were blasted with snow and then followed that followed by several days of below freezing temperatures. Well, in the book, the same thing happened. And I wrote about that in the book, probably, uh, well, I was writing that book when we were in Hawaii in the summer. So it came out a year or so later in March. And I was doing a signing and a lady marched up to the table and she said, you're real fast, aren't you? Uh, she said that snowstorm only happened three weeks ago <laughs> mm. so so this year the the flooding to the south and the snow to the north mm. is almost exactly what shows yeah. up in nothing to lose but it was written long before this year's bad weather. So there's there's real life in the background of my books. And I, I think that's something that makes them interesting for me to write. And interesting to read. Yeah, I, I, as a matter of fact, so uh, we encourage everybody in our audience to uh, go out and uh, read this Nothing to Lose. But I have a question about some of the characters you put together. Uh, oh, my, my favorite character in the whole book is Twink. Oh, Twink, of course. Twinkle, yes. Oh, of course. Yeah. As, as soon as I decided her name was Twinkle Winkleman. Right. Yes. She reminded me in every way of that old uh, Johnny Cash song, a boy. A boy named Sue. Yeah. And Twink was just like that. And she is, I, she's just a presence. Yeah. And when she comes through, 
her and that old international of hers that yep. travel all travel when they all. come through in a pinch. Well, that that was fun. Yep. But where did the travel all come from? Did I have one? No. If I'd been writing it from my own personal history, it would have been a woody nine passenger station wagon. <laughs> but my my husband loves motor trend and he loves wheeler dealers. No. We live in the same house, we share the same TV set, and so we share many of the same shows. And on Wheeler Dealers, they took an old, rusted, rusted, carpet, carpeted interior travel all and put it back together. And I thought that was so interesting because I had no idea International Harvester made vehicles yeah. like that. Yeah. And so that little piece of something I learned in the past few months ended up going right into the books. Yeah. yeah now, but... I, had to, I had to look up uh, what an international travel law was. And I, when I saw the pictures of it online, I said, oh, yeah, that's like the first SUV long before Chevrolet ever decided they, they would make a Suburban. This was what 1950s. Yes, and of course, Twink is driving this beast <laughs> of a truck. And my favorite part is that she's got a 357 Magnum under the seat. Right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that tells you all you need to know about Twink. <laughs> that and and she is a truck driver. Just just thinking about Twink yeah. makes me smile because she is such an intriguing character. And yeah. and Bo is Bo tries to be dismissive of her, and he's he's smart enough to be wary of her because he figures she could clean his clock. <laughs> but their interaction is is really something that when years ago, I was asked to read manuscripts for a writer's conference. And so I that meant I had to read 25 pages of manuscripts by from 20 different people and it was an ordeal but there was one guy who wrote this he wrote a genre jumping time traveling murder mystery mm. and i had several problems with it one of which the case file was a thick paper file which you'd think if they were time traveling they wouldn't need to drag paper around but all of the characters had very ethnic sounding names, but there was nothing about them that was indicative of their ethnicity, except for one who was female officer, number one. Uh. And so I asked him in our time in the barrel together, well, all of the other characters have names. Why didn't you name her? And he said, well, when I did my global search and replace, I must have just forgotten her. And I said, you know, as a writer, it's your responsibility to create these characters. You need to know who they are, how they were raised. Did they live in a two parent family? Were they raised by their grandparents? Did they go to, to YMCA, you know, go, we're Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, who are they? What are they? And I just sort of, I tried to tell him everything he needed to do to be a writer and create characters. And when we finished, he said, but is it still publishable? Well, no, actually it wasn't publishable. So when I sat down to write Nothing to Lose, <laughs> I had to take a piece of my own medicine because a, probably 15 years ago, I wrote Beaumont number 14, a book called Breach of Duty. And in that book, Bo is partnered with a fellow homicide cop, a lady named Sue Danielson. She has two, she's divorced with two young children. Uh, she was in a very abusive marriage and the husband is just, he's just bad news. 
Well, eventually he shows up in town and Bo, by this time, Bo is, he's pulled in, he's met the boys. They know, the, her sons, Jared and Chris, know that he's their mother's partner. And when there's a terrible fight between their parents, Jared, the older boy, calls on Bo to, and says, what, what do I do? And Bo says, take your younger brother, get out of the house, run, I'm coming, I'll be there as soon as I can. Well, that domestic violence incident ends with Sue Danielson bleeding out in the living room. Yep. And so I wrote that book. It was, I actually dedicated it to the silent witnesses. They, there was a program in Washington where they created uh, cardboard, red cardboard statues of all of the women who had died from domestic violence in Washington state that year. And it was, it was a very moving uh, display to see. And so I thought it was an important book and I know it touched me when I, I wrote it. I know it touched my readers because with domestic violence, we all assume that that happens. That doesn't happen to anybody I know. It only happens to people I don't know. It happens mm -hmm. to those other people. Yeah. And in the course of writing my books, Sue Danielson had become someone my readers knew, and they were really moved by her death at the hands of her former husband. So when I started writing this book and Bo gets a knock on the door, he's home alone in a snowstorm. The plumber has fixed the problem and left. And when there's a knock on the door, he thinks it's a plumber come back for more money. <laughs> <laughs> and instead, it turns out to be Sue Danielson's older son, Jared, come to ask for help because his younger brother, Chris, is missing. And suddenly, all the advice I gave to that beginning writer back in that writer's conference came back to haunt me because I had sort of dashed off those characters I didn't really, I didn't know exactly how old they were. I didn't know when they were born. I didn't know. And suddenly I had to go back to that book and read it through and then take everything that I wrote about them and put it in chronological order in terms of not only with what happened to Sue and Bo in that book, but also what's happened to all of the characters in the in the time between then and now. Sure. In in that time, uh, from, from, from the time when um, that book, the Sue Danielson dies, a book, a book number 14, Preacher to Duke. this book, 10, 10 books later, at 10 books and, and, uh, and 10 years later, um, Bo, because this is one of the things I love about your series, Bo as a character, in every book gets a little bit older. It's a natural progression. And he's now retired in book 25. Mm -hmm. Bo is a former Seattle detective, formerly worked for the attorney general, um, did uh, charity work for um, you know, a, a, a cold case firm. And now he's, he's married for the third time. And he's got a wife who's the chief of police in Bellingham, Washington, up on the border, way in the middle of nowhere, from my experience. And she's working and he's retired. And he's got he's had his, got his knees replaced, he's retired. He's not sure what to do with himself and gets a knock on the door and out of the past comes Jared Danielson. Right. Yes. Did, you, did you know that you were gonna go back to visit that book? Did you ever think about that? I didn't, I never thought about it until it was time to start that book. Hmm. And then I thought, 
I know I know who's going to be in this book. I in in a previous book in Sins of the Fathers, uh, I had a previous character show up, and that was somebody from book number four, try, uh, taking the fifth, and it's really it's really fun to bring those threads of storyline forward a couple sure. of decades, but it's also really challenging. Oh, I can imagine. I can imagine. What, another question for you. What took you to Alaska? I mean, Bo has been a Seattle Police Department uh, cop, uh, Washington, state of Washington. And, and all of a sudden, I, I can't recall if he's been elsewhere, but um, primarily, this book it takes place in Alaska. Well, at, at the time I wrote that book, Sue Danielson's former husband was from Alaska. But wow. at the time I wrote that book, I had never been to Alaska. I've been to Alaska several times since. Uh, and in fact, on one of the trips to Alaska, I, I finally found a long lost childhood friend to whom I dedicated a book a decade earlier. And, and I was able to read connect with her and she was living in Alaska. She still is living in Alaska. One of the things I really love about your writing uh, is that you uh, do research and bring in like a lot of things that are really unique to the area or the people you're dealing with, such as, um, for instance, you uh, talked about uh, native language in, in this as you did in the Walker uh, family of the Southwest, but this is Alaska. And you talked about uh, Blizzak tires and uh, the travel wall, of course, uh, uh, and what have you. So where do you come up with this, this research? This, do you just trip over the stuff? I, I come up with the stuff and then I, then I ask actually for, for, as I was writing this, I got a hold of my, my childhood friend from, from who lives in Alaska now. And I said, okay, what, what would somebody call an Alaska outsider? If you lived in Alaska, what would you call somebody who was from the lower 48 who came there knowing nothing? And she said, Chitako. Okay. Well, <laughs> I was, that's sort of not a nice way of saying it there. That's, that's sort of insulting. And it goes with the territory. I think we all have, when somebody comes here and calls Puyallup, Puyallup, or yes. Squim, Sequim, you know who an outsider is. And it, you just can't help but be sort of superior about it. And I was under the impression that that was a word I had never heard. But then I mentioned that word in my in a blog, and someone sent me a recording of a totally politically incorrect song from the 50s, which has that word in it clearly in the chorus and the and the song is squaws along the yukon are good enough for me and so <laughs> <laughs> but the uh what do you what do you call we call in tucson we call the university of arizona the u of a mm. eugene is the u of o well what do you call the university of alaska in anchorage I had to call and find, call somebody and and ask that question, uh, and and I did a lot of research to get the right words, the the right uh, indigenous words for for Alaska natives, and uh, one of the other character I really like in this book, and in, in addition to Twink, is the uh, the professor of anthropology 
Oh, uh, yeah. In charge of human remains yes. in the state Har of Alaska. Harry. Harry. Harriet, Dr. Harriet Rains. <laughs> Har <laughs> commonly known as Harry to her friends. <laughs> and Bo just can't quite bring himself to call her Harry because as far as he's concerned, the only Harry in the in the universe is his <laughs> former uh, his former boss at <clears throat> the special homicide investigation team with <laughs> who was harry eyeball <laughs> harry ignatius ball yeah. so uh <laughs> but i harry is another one of those characters who who is just she's just there and and she understands stuff and her understanding of exactly what Bo said, not just the story he told, but everything behind it is what creates the ending of that book. Yes. Um, in On the reservation, one of the things I learned about Tahana Adam storytelling is that a story must end where it begins and and in this book you find Bo the story starts with that awful nightmare he has lived with for all these years with Stu Danielson dying yeah in her own living room that's how the book starts and that's how the book ends yeah right I had an interesting thing happen the last couple of weeks. I heard from a young woman named White Vaughn, whose uh, father is a Pima. Uh, the, the desert people are the Tohono O'odham, and the Pima are the Akmel O'odham, the river people up by the Gila River. And her father is, uh, her father doesn't, she said her father loved the Walker books. He didn't, he doesn't have the internet. So she was writing to tell me how much he, uh, he loved the books. And that meant so much to me to know that I was hearing that from someone who is in that culture because I'm, I'm an outsider. And, okay, totally off the subject. Do, do you mind if I go off the subject? Oh, not yeah. at all. Uh, when I was on the reservation, there was a fellow there named Dean Saxton who was creating a, a Pima, a, a English Papago dictionary. This was back when the Tohono O'odham were still called Papago, which was a name the Spaniards gave them, as opposed to their traditional name, Tohono O'odham, which they have since taken back. But uh, so as a, when I started writing the Walker family books, I, I have a very well-thumbed copy of Dean Saxon's dictionary. When my daughter was born, we were living on the reservation and I had worked for five years. I had worked with these little brown faced kids. And when my daughter was born, she was white and I thought she was sick. And my, uh, a, Pauline Hendricks, my aide in the library said, Judy, she isn't sick. She's Uchu. And I said, what's that? She said, well, it means pretty one. And so on the reservation, everybody has the name that's on their birth certificate. And then they have their Indian name, which is the name that's bestowed on them by some beloved elder in the family or in the neighborhood. And so that became my daughter's Indian name. So when my, uh, when my grandson was in second grade, he came home one day and he said, Grandma, my mom has an Indian name. I would like to have an Indian name too. Or in Bellevue, Washington, there aren't that many Indians around. 
but on the reservation, they told me I was big toe Indian. Big toe Indian has so little Indian blood that only your big toe actually qualifies. But I was certainly an elder, so I gave him a name. He has lovely bronze colored hair, not red, really bronze. And uh, the word for, the Tahana Adam word for red is wiggy. And in that language, if you put an S before a word, that makes it whatever that is in a good way. So, so wiggy means good red. And uh -uh, on means feather. The Tahana Adam don't put an S on the end of a word for to make a plural. They simply say the word twice. So I gave my grandson the name Sawigi Ahan, which means red feathers because of his hair. That's great. So when I wrote back to White Fawn, I told her that story. And I said, I tried looking up Skauchu in, in the dictionary. And I, could you please ask your dad to tell me what the proper spelling is? And she wrote back and he, she said, your spelling is fine. And what that means is someone who will grow up to be perfect in every way. And I was so touched that Pauline from all those years ago bestowed mm. that name on my daughter. Oh, that's beautiful. That's a beautiful story. You know, you have, uh, when we talked last time, we, got the details of your life and your story uh, as a writer, as well as talked about the various book series that you've done with uh, J.P. Beaumont and Allie Reynolds and uh, Joanna Brady, uh, Joanna Brady who, who, who you're getting emails from, <laughs> and, um, and the Walker family. And it's interesting because I can see, uh, being a, a, a reader of many of your books, I can see, and I'm reading the Walker books now, I can see little bits and pieces of your story in all of them. Yes, it's true. I'm, yeah, with, with Bo literally. as well, even though Bo is a male I'm, character. I'm really lazy. I, I can't make everything up. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't have to because you've, you've lived a, a pretty fantastic life, pretty interesting. You know, uh, by, the, by the way, by the way, I would be re remiss. I would be remiss to the audience uh, since the last time we spoke. Uh, one of my treasured uh, objects, something I purchased based on uh, hearing about it from you, was uh, I don't care how many J. A. Jance books you've read, if you don't get this one. Oh. A book of poetry yeah. after the book fire. of poetry after the fire. It is yeah. absolutely one of the most touching uh, books, and to me, what it did was it reinforced what I like so much about you, J.A., which is that no matter what happens in somebody's life, as long as you have a breath and you have a dream, there's no reason why you can't fulfill that dream. And after, and I, I've done a pretty accurate count. You've written 70 books plus After the Fire. Uh, many of the books, uh, uh, well, four or five of them are actually dual characters. And I can't wait to get to them. I'm, I'm trying to read up to an IOR in order reader of Beaumont <laughs> and some of the others so that I get it. So when I get to the book, I get it at the right time. Uh, but um, After the Fire, I highly recommend to go buy it and enjoy it. And if you ever feel that you need to be like J.A. Jance, somebody who doesn't give up and has a wonderful life and, and the ability to share her wonderful stories, uh, because th half a life ago, that didn't exist. This has all been done in, the second in her second act, if you will. Yes. Actually, I was thinking about that this morning as I was getting ready. Uh, I didn't start writing my first, I, I wrote the poetry starting in the 60s, but that wasn't, 
actually published until 1984. But I didn't sit down to write my first novel until the middle of March of 1982. And a few years later on, I was interviewed by some young woman, I, I don't know, she was, it was probably a newspaper somewhere, I don't think I ever saw the actual article. But she wanted to know, she said, well, how old were you when you started writing? And I said, well, I was 38 when I sat down to write my first novel and I was 41 when Until Proven Guilty was published. And she said, <coughs> excuse me, you were so old. <laughs> <laughs> She should see how old I am now. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank goodness age doesn't have anything to do with it. That's right. all I can say. Otherwise, you would have never gotten to 25 books with uh, Beaumont. Beaumont alone. But, yeah. But, yeah. But I've lived this incredibly full life. My, my first husband was such incredibly bad husband material. And if you read, <laughs> if you read, after the fire, you think, yeah. how come she couldn't figure that out without waiting around for 18 years? Yeah. Well, that's, that's a whole other story. But uh, living with him made me who I am today. Uh, being, living on the hill with that serial killer tracking us in May of 1970, Mm -hmm. and walking around with a loaded pistol on my hip. Uh, not a pistol, it was a revolver. Excuse me, I misspoke. Um, but that was part of me becoming who I am. In, yeah. in 1967, I went to, he was working in, in the Chicago area, working construction, and, and we went to his favorite divey, place bar in Hammond, Indiana, and a gunfight broke out. And I ended up standing behind a big tree outside. You know, you have to be married to a certain kind of man to have those experiences. Yeah. But I have those experiences to call on when I'm writing a book. Uh, they make for great mm. novels. They're <laughs> not, they sure don't seem like they happen to anybody other than a character in a novel but they they make wonderful stories. By the, by the way, because we, we John and I uh, speak about you a lot. We, we love you as do many of your other readers, but we like you as a person and that's why we really enjoy speaking with you. So uh, I would say that people do have something to lose if they don't get and read nothing to lose. And we need to so keep encouraging J.A., although I don't think it takes much encouragement, because uh, you're probably, at two a year, you've probably got another book almost um, and working on the one after that. Which begs the question, what's next? What's next? Well, I'm, you know, I, I sort of fell off a creative cliff earlier this, this summer when I was working on the next Alley book, Collateral Damage. And it has been a real struggle. And, and finally, I, I was able to sort through and see what was wrong with the way I was telling the story. And now finally, the characters are talking to me and telling me stuff instead of me just tossing and turning at night saying, what am I going to do now? Now I can see the direction. So collateral damage is coming to order. And then I'm not sure what I'll be writing after that. I'll need to discuss that with my my editor. It'll either be another Joanna book or another Walker book, but I can't tell. Well, I want so to. You, you, it, yeah, it sounds like you like to jump between your characters. You don't like to do two Beaumont books in a row or two Allie Reynolds books in a row. Right. If I if I I could never have been Sue Grafton. I could not have written that many books about one character in a row. I, I have a limited attention span. <laughs> <laughs> it would never have worked. <laughs> By the way, well, I, I, I have, to, have I, to tell John, you. John, I also want to recommend to people that um, uh, besides getting after the fire, I guarantee you that you're going to love it. But besides oh. that, 
The uh, thing about JA, JA has a uh, blog at her website, jajads.com, and we'll put that link in the uh, description down below. Uh, and uh, uh, I actually I asked the question about what's next because I, I today uh, read uh, your blog about um, uh, this wonderful young lady named Danielle. Uh, people should go to your site and read the blog, okay? And uh, it's a very touching story. And there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of weekly blogs there that I think people would really enjoy in between books when you're, when you're waiting for the next J.A. Jans book to come in. Go to her, her, her blog and see what's going on there. It's really beautiful. The blogs come out every Friday, and they're a window on my life. They allow people a, a glimpse of the person behind the words. And I think, I think that's important. If you're going to, uh, you can, if you know a little about the person writing them, you know how much weight to give to the words in their stories. Hmm. That's interesting. That's an interesting perspective. Well, um, your, your words are inspiring and I think awfully entertaining. Hmm. I just, I, I find it hard to put a book down. Thank and, uh, you. <laughs> and I'm kind of I'm kind of doing what you're doing, uh, only as a reader. I'm jumping between. I just finished, of course, uh, the uh, advanced copy of uh, Nothing to Lose with J. Uh, J. P. Beaumont. But I'm now into the first Walker book. Mm -hmm. I'm planning on reading your series about uh, the Walkers, and I've already gotten what I think is more than halfway through the Allie Reynolds series and probably a little further along the Joanna Brady series. So I kind of like to jump back and forth. I, I don't stick with one of them at a, you know, two, two in a row. I, th I think that's a good idea. You well, thank, I'm glad you did four series. Well, let's see. So, so can we have, can we have a commitment? We're going to put you on the spot. We'd love to have you back any day. Just call us and, We'd love to talk to you, but certainly when your next book comes out, uh, which All is right. a couple of months from now, right? Uh, it'll be it'll be probably in the summer. Okay, so we would love to have you back and talk about that, and uh, and lots of other interesting stuff that just pops out of your mind to say, yeah, this is how it happened, and this is what influenced <laughs> it. So we we love that about you. Uh, it's just a great conversation, and you feel like a long term friend. And you are. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. J.A., thank you so much for sharing and for the books. Yes, and now, once I turn this off, Zoom has been telling me I need to upgrade. So once I leave this meeting, uh -oh. I'm going to Technology. upgrade. Technology, <laughs> okay. watch out. Okay. All right. Oh, so we'll okay. end this conversation and uh, look forward to seeing you again real soon. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.